لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعد الله رحمة للعالمين الله مصلي وسلم وبارك وأن معنا نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so this is our twelfth class on the عقيدة الوسطية today is the twenty fifth of January. 2022 corresponds to the 21st of Jumaat al-Akhir, 1443, which means we're approximately 10 weeks away from Ramadan. SubhanAllah, Nasallahu Azza wa Jalla, Yibaligana, Shahra Ramadan. And inshallah, we're going to start on page uh, where we left off, which was on page, towards the end of page 83. Uh, we'll move into Al-Imam Al-Yawm Al-Akhir as we get to... Uh, the middle of the dars, inshallah ta'ala. So tonight's topics, uh, Dr. Mukhtar, can you read those for us? Jazakallah khair. And the mic is thani. And the mic is thani. Jazakallah khair. Oh, you guys trying to say I'm a little guy with big mouth, huh? So uh, w- yeah, what uh, I'll do while we're waiting, I- I'll read these so we don't, we don't use uh, more time than necessary. Oh, you're, you're there. Bismillah. Let's go. Tonight's ahead. topics, Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulah al-kareem, the blame of the and regime, the remaining divine attributes, closeness, speech, being seen, defining the last day, the trial of the grave, punishment and bliss in the grave. Khairan. So um, turn to the end of page 83. I know it says 84 here, but I believe that this is towards the end of page uh, 83 in your book. Fadl Sheikh. This is from the speech of Sheikh Al-Islam and Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, who says, included in this belief, in this. Mm. Allah is qareeb and mujib. Included, and this is the belief that he is close and responds. Okay, so included in this. Again, part of our, the reason why we read books and we don't just, um, and we don't just bring you the material, but we're actually going through books is because it's important to learn how to read the books of the scholars. Mm. All right? A lot of the uh, material that we have in the English language has been translated and getting used to that style is also important. So it says included in this. What is this? What is this? Included in this. Hmm. What have we been covering the whole time up until now? Belief in what? Belief in Allah, as a joke, and his names and his attributes. Okay? So included in that, yeah, I need in the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his name is the attributes is the belief that Allah is close and responds. Okay. He has mentioned both of these matters in his saying, Ida sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb ujibu da'wata da'i ida da'an. Now, follow If my slaves ask you about me, I am near. I answer the call of the caller when he calls on me. The Prophet وسلم, said, the one you are invoking is closer to one of you than the neck of his riding beast. All right, so here, the two things that Shaykh al is mentioning is that Allah is close and that he responds. But there's a difference between Allah Azza wa Jal being close, his qurb, and that he is qareeb, and him being mujib, that is, that he responds. There's a difference between the qurb, his closeness, and his ma'iyya, which we've been using withness. All right? What's the difference? I'll give you a hint. We said that ma'iyya, or Allah Azza wa Jal being with his servants, is of two types. Right? Sorry? That he, that he aids them and that he helps them. So what type of ma'iyya is this? What type of witness is this? Does he aid the kuffar? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, that, sorry? 
la, la, so when, when we talk about Nusratullah Azza wa Jalli Abdi, right, that he is aiding them in the sense that he is giving them victory, that he is that he is protecting them and so forth, then this is specific to, to the believers. And it gets more sp special according to the Iman of the one that we're talking about, right? So the Ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Musa and Harun when they were alayhim as salam when they were going to Fir'aun and he said innani ma'akuma asma'u wa ara i am with the two of you i hear and i see that's different from the witness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with with his you know believing servants that are muttaqin but not on the level of the of the anbiya but it's still special so when we break down witness or ma'iyah we're talking about two kinds we special Right? For the believers. And then there is the ma'iyah, what? That is am. It's general. It's for all of the creation. And that is that Allah Azza wa Jal is, is with them with his knowledge, his hearing, uh, his seeing them, and so forth. Not the same. It's different. It's different, right? When you say, I see everything that you do, that's one thing, right? That lets the, the person know that you're, that you're watching them. It's the difference between that. And saying, look, I'm watching you every step of the way. Don't worry about it. I got you. I'm watching. If, if I need to intervene, I'll intervene. That's two different, two different scenarios, two different types. right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's the ma'iyah that is amma for all of his creation. And then there is the ma'iyah or the witness that is specific to, to the believers. Now, when we talk about closeness, that Allah azza wa jalla is qareeb, then the texts of the Quran and Sunnah, including the two texts that have been used here, are indicative of closeness being only for the believers, and we don't talk about a general closeness. So if you look at the first one, What what context does this come in in the first place? Anybody know where this ayah comes? What kind? Yeah, Ahmed. And Surah Al-Baqarah, but what's the context? What, what, what's, what's happening before this ayah and after this ayah? Ramadan. Ramadan and fasting. Right, fasting and Ramadan. <laughs> That's the context of this ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي anni," Right? Here, ibad is not just talking about any abd that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. He's talking about his worshipping servants, those who worship him. So, if my worshiping servants ask you about me, meaning those who choose to worship him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about me, for inni qareeb, I am truly close. I am truly close. So close that what? Ujibu da'wa tadai ida da'an. So that when they call upon me, I answer their call. And the Prophet alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam, and this hadith already preceded, the one that you are invoking, what are they doing at the time when the Prophet said that he's closer to them? What are they doing? They're invoking him. They're doing dhikr. They're doing dua, right? So this is showing that his qurb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's closeness, is for the believers, right? And the Prophet sallallahu said that one of you is closest to Allah when? In sujood. In sujood. He is in sujood, right? And so that is... One of the best places to make du'a is when you are in suju, because that is when you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam, Shaykh. What has been what has been mentioned in the book and sunnah of his closeness and withness does not contradict his highness and aboveness. There is nothing like him. Glorious is he in all his descriptions. He is high in his creed, in his nearness. And near in his highness. Subhanallah. No. Qareebun fi uluwihi wa aliyun fi dunuwihi. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Akhi, could you read the Arabic of that? I think I just did. I tried to anyway. That's the way I remember it. I didn't hear you. Huwa aliyun fi dunuwihi. No. Qareebun fi uluwihi. هو علي في دنوه قريب في علوه. Hmm? That's it. الحمد لله. خير. Next. 
Faith in Allah and his books entails the belief that the Qur'an is Allah's speech. It is revealed by him and is not created. From him it came and to him shall it return. Allah uh, spoke. I, I want you to pay attention to every word that is here because everything that he is saying, he's saying it for a reason. All right? Now. From him it came and to him shall it return. Allah spoke it literally. This Quran which he revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the speech of Allah literally. It is not the speech of another and it is not permissible to state that it is an account of the speech of Allah or an expression of it. Indeed, even when people recite it or write it in books, it still does not cease to be the literal speech of Allah. Most high. This is because speech, in its real sense, is attributed to the one who originally uttered it and not to the one who conveyed it from him. The Quran is the speech of Allah in its letters and its meanings. The speech of Allah is not words without meaning, nor meaning without words. All right, so what we're going to do, inshallah, is we're going to go over like seven points that the author mentioned here individually, and then we go back and read this again, make sure that we understand exactly what the author is saying. Again, in general, you're not going to find in this aqidah that the author writes something for no reason. If he's penning it down, and especially here when we're talking about uh, where, where he's saying it is not the speech of it, why do you think he's saying it's not this, it's not that? Because somebody is claiming that. So he's coming now to tell you that's not the case. All right? Tell you. So let's look at these, these uh, seven points here. Read the first one, Sheikh. It is not created. Right. So... We'll go back and read. All of this is directly from what Sheikh Al-Islam said. So the first thing that he said is that it is, well, the first thing that we're going to talk about. Because the first part is not really the people of Islam in general. They all believe that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that the Quran is from Allah. Right? Uh, here it says, faith in, Allah, in the book entails the belief that the Quran is Allah's speech. It is revealed by him. Yeah, I mean, they believe that it is revealed by Allah. But not everybody says that it is uncreated or that it is not created. In fact, it was a big mihna, big trial and inquisition at the time of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala where there was a khalifa who was making ilzam, making it mandatory upon the scholars to say that the Quran is created. And many of them Many of the scholars acquiesced, either because they felt that it was ikrah, and it meaning that they were co coerced, because if they wouldn't do it, they'd be killed, right? And so they, or, or they used, um, do you know what tawri is? Uh, what's tawri? How do you translate that? Say it again, Sheikh. A play on words? Yeah, okay. That, I like that. That's the first time I've heard that. But that's, I like that. It's a play on words. So they would say, for example, they would say, At-Tawratu wal-Injilu wal-Qur'anu wal-Zabur. Kul ha'ula makhluk. Right? The Qur'an, the Injil, uh, the, the, the Torah, the Zabur, all of those, all of those are created. But what do they mean? It means his fingers. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, so he's trying to get out of it as a play on words, right? He's trying to get out of the, the problem. But Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he stood firm. Very, and, and he was in prison for 28 months and beaten almost daily. Because he would not say that the Quran is created. And it became from the way of Ahl Sunnah, when they talk about the Quran, to say that the Quran is kalamullahi ghayru makhluq not created or uncreated. Tell you, is there anywhere in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ where it explicitly says that the Quran is not created? Hmm? There's nowhere where it says that explicitly. Tell you. Interesting debate between... Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, there, there's several debates that actually happened. One of them was Ibn Abi Duat, who said that the Quran was created. 
And uh, uh, in this particular debate, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said to him, is this something that the Prophet sallallahu wasallam and the companions were aware of, right? That the Quran was created? If so, huh? and they didn't say anything about it, as you don't have any evidence from the Prophet and the companions, if so, then yes, it's sufficient for you is what was sufficient for them and just don't say anything about it. Or they didn't know about it, right? They didn't know that, that and, and, and you know, or are you claiming that you know something that the Prophet Sallallahu didn't know? So then he tried to switch it on Imam Ahmed. And he said, wait a minute, did they say that it was uncreated, right? And if not, then did they know what you didn't know? So Imam Ahmed said, uskutu neskut. If you all be quiet, then we'll be quiet. In other words, if you don't say that the Quran is created, there'd be no reason for us to come back and tell you that it's uncreated. And how can the speech of Allah, which is an attribute of the creator himself, how can an attribute of the creator himself be created? Right? And, and there's plenty of evidence in the Quran. I mean, what I'm saying is from the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, it clearly showed us the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When ahadun min al-mushrikeen astajaraka fa ajirhu hatta yasma'a kalam Allah. If one of the mushrikeen come to you seeking your protection, then give them that protection so that they can what? Hear the kalam of Allah. It's Allah's kalam. And his kalam is uncreated. And Allah is what is uncreated. And it's his attribute. The, the point here is you'll see as we go along, for example, like look at the third one down. It says Allah what? Spoke it literally. And this is something that Shaykh al-Islam uses from time to time. He says, bihi haqiqatan. He spoke it literally. Tell is there anywhere in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet where that type of language is used? Literally? No. Why do you think Shaykh al-Islam says literally? Hmm. And even those who came before him. Why would they say literally? Yalla, come on. Because maybe. Mafi, maybe. Yalla, because what? Tell you, why did he say, stay with me, why did, why did the Salaf say uncreated? Because what? Because there are people who said that the Quran was created. Why do you think he said literally, even though that doesn't exist anywhere in the, in the text? Right, because other people said, no, it's figurative. So in, the, in, in English, I mean, Afwan, in Arabic, you have haqiqa and you have what? Majaz, right. So you have those sects from Islam who say that we'll affirm these attributes for Allah, majazan, majazan. If they don't say majazan, then there's no reason to say haqiqatan. It's no point. Yeah, go ahead. We take everything literal until there's a evidence to indicate otherwise. We we take it as it comes, as it comes. We don't have to. We don't have to say literal because speech in general, people mean what they say. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, as we said from the very beginning, man asdaq min Allahi qilan. And who is more truthful in speech than Allah? Woman ahsanu min Allahi haditha. So. Allah Azza wa Jal is the best in speech. So, what Allah Azza wa, Allah Azza wa Jal says, what he means. And so we take it as it comes, right? Without what? Without distorting it, without re rejecting it, and so forth. Tight. So the Quran is uncreated. Allah Lika'i, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, in his uh, creed, he mentioned with the isnad over 500 scholars of Islam, and Lali Ka'i was a 5th century guy, he died in 400 something, he's a 5th century scholar. He mentioned with his Islam, back to the scholars of Islam, over 500 scholars who all said that the Quran, Kalamullahi ghayru makhluq. The Quran is the Kalam of Allah, uncreated. And there's ijma' amongst the scholars on this particular issue. Tayyip next. From him. From him it initiated, and to him shall it return. 
يعني the 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 kalam of Allah subhanahu wa taala is from Allah. ولكن حق ال ولكن حق القول مني الله سبحانه وتعالى said and Allah عز وجل said تنزيل من رب العالمين that it is revelation from رب العالمين حق القول مني this statement from me is the truth so Allah Azza wa Jal attributes the Quran to Him. It is from Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. Why is this important? As you'll see when we go down uh, to to the next points, there are some of Ahlul Bid'ah who say that the words of the Quran are not from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right? The meaning is from Allah, but not the words. It's not from mm -hmm. Allah. <clears throat> from Him it came. Or it was initiated, and to him shall it return. Let's let's read because there are two different interpretations for to him shall it return, right? And this is um, very common in the kalam of the salaf. Father, read here, Sheikh. To him it returns, and they're saying to him it returns. There are two views about its meaning. Firstly that it is as reported in some reports that it will be ascended with during a night it, it will be taken up taken up during the night no. and people will wake up not finding the quran before them neither in their hearts nor in their mushafs allah the mighty and sublime would have raised it unto himself this is based upon based upon what was reported by abdullah ibn mas'ud radiallahu an from him that the Qur'an is to be taken from between yourselves. A night would pass on it, then it would be gone from the ajwaf, the hearts of men. Thus, not a thing remains from it. Also, reported by At-Tabarani, yeah, Rahimullah. That. That's just uh, talking about the... Uh, nah. Next. This will happen. This will happen, and Allah knows best, when the people begin to turn away from it in its entirety they would not they will not recite it with their tongue nor believe it nor act upon it so it will be raised because the quran is more honorable than to remain among people who deserted it Whew. turned away from it and refused to give it its proper due and this will be at the end of time as the prophet mentioned that the hour will be established where they would not even be amongst the people those who say Allah, Allah. All right. So towards the end of time is when the Quran will be will be raised from the masahif and from the hearts of men. From men who bedat wa ilayhi yaud is started from Allah subhanahu wa taala, and to Him it will return. The second view concerning this meaning. The second view concerning the meaning of their saying to Him it returns is that it will return to Allah in description. That is. No one other than Allah is described with it. So, the one speaking the Qur'an is Allah, the mighty and sublime. And he is the one described with it. And there is nothing that prevents us from saying that both of these meanings are correct. Even though the majority of the scholars uh, lean towards the first view. Yeah. This is the statement of the people of the Sunnah and Jama'ah. Concerning the noble Quran. All right. So it is not created from him. It is. It has come, and to him it shall return. Allah spoke it literally or verbatim, meaning what? That we affirm the attribute of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala speaking as it comes. That it is not the speech of someone else. So, so go to go to number four and five because this will make it clear, inshallah. Not an account, hikaya, of Allah's speech. Not an expression, ibarah, of Allah's speech. Ah, okay. What does this mean? So Sheikh Al-Islam mentions this, so we have to deal with it. There are, from the people of Bid'ah, those who say that the Quran is a hikaya of Allah's speech. Did you, huh? Hikaya, Yahki Hikaya, or Yuhaki, even, right? So, Al Muhakat is when somebody copies someone else, okay? 
So, so another way they translate an account is a rendering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. So it's not actually his speech, but it is a rendering of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It'll become clear as we go to the next one. Obviously, a rendering of something is not the thing itself. Even when you talk about a hikaya, a hikaya, have you, have you, for those who speak Arabic, what, what is a hikaya? Narration. Huh? A narration. A narration, right. So it's a narration. So it's basically like you heard something, huh? And then you came and you told the story about what it was. Mm -hmm. So why do they say an account or an expression? Because they don't actually affirm kalam for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can be heard. The kalam that they affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what they call al-kalam and nafsi Okay? So an internal speech or self-speech. And so therefore what we're hearing is a hikaya. It is a it is what Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam, the, the angel Jibreel, took to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but those are not the words, actual words of Allah. Tell you. It's an expression of a law of speech. Why can't it be a law of speech? Because you can't hear a law of speech according to them. Because his kalam is what? Nafsi. And, and there's reasons why. And this, this is, it gets a, a lot deeper because they're, they're taking external philosophies and ideologies. And therefore, they cannot affirm that Allah Azza wa Jal actually does something. That's a problem for them. Nah. We, if, if they affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something, then it, it negates the entire premise on which they uh, affirm his existence. But that's a story for a different day. It's way deeper than, than, than the scope of what Al-Aqid al does. But well, I want you to understand what he means when he says not an expression of Allah's speech. Imagine somebody right now who's using sign language to communicate. Are they speaking? Hmm? I mean, are they using words to speak? No. They're communicating through sign language. We don't understand sign language, but there's someone who will translate that sign language for us. Right? So they understand sign language, and then they start speaking. The words that they are speaking is an expression of the meanings of with the person who was using sign language intended. Okay? But that person is not actually speaking. So someone comes along and they say, he's saying or she's saying A, B, C, and D. So and it's, it's an expression of their speech. Okay? And so some of Ahlul Bid'ah, they say that the Quran, as we hear it and as we read it, is an expression of Allah's speech. That's and it's not actually the kalam of Allah. It's the expression of Jibreel that he took to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Clear? And they exist today in this city. And in every city across the United States. Allah musta'an. Amen. Now, just, just a question about the future of what you're saying. Are, are you going to relate tonight Ahmed uh, uh, Rahimullah's dream? No. Okay, please. Read the next one. Speech. Speech is attributed to the one who originally uttered it. So, so it doesn't, right now, whose speech is this? Actions are by their intentions. Whose speech is that? The Prophet. The Prophet. Does it matter who else says it? Is it their speech? No, it's the speech of the Prophet So when we talk about someone's kalam, it's the person who originally uttered that speech, not someone else who may have conveyed that speech. Okay? So that, that's what he's saying. When, when we talk about the speech of Allah, it doesn't matter who's saying it, it's still Allah's kalam. Now, Both the letters and the meanings are from Allah. Right, and that's because, as we mentioned before, those who say that the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only self-speech, kalam nafsi, 
then they say the meaning is from Allah. As far as the letters themselves, then those letters are not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore the words are not from Allah Jalla Jalal. Let us go back, read this one more time, Shaykh. Faith in Allah and his books entails the belief that the Quran is Allah's speech. It is revealed by him and is not created. Now you see why he said it is not created? Okay, keep going. From him it came and to him shall it return. Clear? All right. Now. Allah spoke it literally. Mm -hmm. This Quran which he revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the speech of Allah. Literally, mm -hmm. it is not the speech of another. It's, and not, it's not the speech of someone else. Even if someone else says it, it's still Allah's speech because speech is is attributed to the one who said it originally. No. And it is not permissible to state that it is an account of the speech of Allah, a rendering or a hikaya of Allah's speech, or no. an expression of it. The ibara, right? Indeed, even when people recite it or write it in books, it still does not cease to be the literal speech of Allah, Most High. This is because speech in its real sense is attributed to the one who originally or uttered it, not to the one who conveyed it from him. The Quran is the speech of Allah in its letters and its meaning. The speech of Allah is not words without meaning, nor meaning without Words. And, 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 and we as the Muslims, and this is very, I, you know, again, subhanAllah, sometimes you just have to kind of go with the flow of the book. But understanding why this is so important to Muslims, and you, you really won't get it until, or, or maybe yani, by understanding what other people believe about their books, then we understand better why Islam, why we value the Quran so much, right? So, so I'll ask you now, the Christians, do they believe that the New Testament is the word of God? No. <clears throat> they believe that it was inspired. Type. some of you used to be Christians. So. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Do Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God? Hmm? Yeah. Not like we do, though. Ah. Okay. Right. So they believe that it's the word of God, but not like we do. What do you mean by that? They believe that hey, it was. You, you got a mic and nobody can hear you. Sir. <laughs> SubhanAllah. <laughs> right. but, okay. It means that they believe that it was inspired, but the actual words are not from him. Right. So, so what's that mean exactly? Huh? Exactly. It's an expression. It's an ibara of Allah's speech. But not see, so they believe that that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that all of them were inspired, right, by the Holy Ghost, which is the Thadi that's their third of three in their Trinity, right? By the Holy Ghost. That they were inspired to to write these words. There's a big difference between being inspired to write certain words down and those words coming from Rabbul Alameen directly to Jibreel, to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to those who took it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until this day, and we have that isnat, right? Which, which also does not exist in the other dianet, I mean, the, the other deans. They just don't have that. I mean, the fact that we have have given the Quran so much attention, right? Is is a true testament, honey, to the beauty of this deen. Now don't don't take this um, as as just being dogma, you know, something that you're just supposed to memorize and keep it moving. Appreciate appreciate the fact that we have the literal words of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as serve as guidance for mankind. Khairan. No, next, inshallah. Seeing, seeing Allah on the day of rising, included in what we have mentioned of having faith in him, his books, and his messengers, 
is the belief that the believers will see him on the day of rising with their eyes, just as they see the sun on a clear day free of clouds, and just as they see the moon when it is full, without experiencing any difficulty in seeing him. Glorious is he. They will see him on the, when on the great plain on the day of rising, and they will see him after entering paradise as Allah most high wills. Tayyip, so we covered this uh, previously, which is al-ru'ya, that is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yawm al-qiyamah. And this is actually going to take us, uh, serve as a, as a bridge into a belief in, in the last day. The, the thing here, though, is he says at the end, they will see him on the great, when on the great plain of yawm al-qiyamah, and they will see him after entering paradise. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. So what are, we, what are we looking at here? There's two different experiences. One is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi arasat al-qiyamah. And the arasat uh, are, the, are, are the plains. They, the, the plains of the qiyamah. I mean, there's nothing that distinguishes any part of the land from any other part of the land. Okay, so we talk about the plains. There's nothing there. Nothing, no distinguishing uh, points at all. No trees to make this part look different from that part or anything else. So they'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day, but that's different from seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. The seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day, uh, according to the correct opinion, will not just be for the believers, but it will be all of the creation. Seeing him on that day is so that Allah subhanahu is a, is a trial for the people, and it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making himself known to the creation. The seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah is in'am, tashrif, yani that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing his servants and allowing them to see his face, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the greatest ni'mah for the people of Jannah. And the greatest pleasure that they'll have is seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah azza wa jal to make us from amongst them. Amen. So it's two different uh, experiences. And that should be clear, inshallah ta'ala. Obviously, those who do not enter Jannah will not have that experience of seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the first seeing is this the reference to the ayah al Comes to that in that form? Is that a yeah. And another here is is waiting, yeah. Uh, yeah, waiting. So it's not it's, that's not about ru'ya. Yeah. Yet tiyahum Allah doesn't mean they're going to see Allah. Not then. The first sighting in the Yom Qiyam is it pleasurable to the believers as well? Nah, nah. Shuf, Subhanallah. And as as we've covered before. This, this will be the third time, actually, that we're going over Iman bil Yawm al-Akhir. And if it was the 30th time, it wouldn't be enough, right? The, the believers, subhanAllah, the one that has gained Allah's pleasure, from the time they die, the experience is pleasurable. And we'll cover some of that tonight, inshallah. Tayyip, fadha. Al-Iman bil Yawm al-Akhir. Faith in the last day. Included in having faith in the last day is to believe in all that the Prophet ﷺ informed us of regarding what will happen after death. Tayyip, so if, if we want to give a definition for faith in the last day, you can say a comprehensive term for everything that happens after death. Ismu jami' lima yaqa'u ba'd al mawt so a comprehensive term for everything that happens after death as the iman in the last day. That's according to Shaykh al-Islam who uses the last day synonymously with, with the hereafter. And there are other scholars who distinguish between the hereafter and the last day. What they mean by the hereafter is everything that happens after death, whereas the last day is what happens from the resurrection on. Okay? So, what's the difference between those two definitions? 
So the hereafter is after you die, okay? And Yom Al-Qiyamah is what? Yeah, when, it, when, it, uh, everyone is being raised. when everyone is being raised. So, so from the time that the horn is blown, the first time. Yeah. Like, so what happens between those two times? Between you die and the barzakh. <coughs> the barzakh. So, so for that definition, right, for those who look at the hereafter, right, as, as being what happens after death, anything that happens after death, then for them there's two separate stages. There's the barzakh and then there's Yom Al-Qiyamah, what happens after that. It's, it's just terminology, but it's good to understand where, where they may be coming from. So everything that happens after death. Trial of the grave. Number one, conceptualization. Number two, evidence for its existence. And number three, the believer versus the kafir. Why do you think when talking about the hereafter, we start by talking about the trial of the great? Because that is the first thing. This is why Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they would see him yani, crying at the grave sometime and it would say we don't see you respond like this even when you hear about the hellfire why why at the grave he said because this is awwal manazil al akhirah right this is the first stage of the hereafter whoever is successful here will be successful what comes after right and it is important and that when we and I don't I don't want to take too much time going through the muqaddimat because we can cover some of this next week inshallah we got off to a late start today and I don't want to delay salat al isha uh yani past 7:15 but it is very very important that we consider the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has joined between belief in him and belief in the hereafter over 40 places in the Quran there's a reason for that and you find in the hadith of the Prophet like some mechanic, you know, Billahi, what? Well, the Omil Akhir, several hadith. Yeah, you don't find that same mechanic, you know, Billahi, well, Malaika, Falyafa. Mechanic, you know, whoever believes in Allah and his angels do this, whoever believes in Allah and his books do this, whoever believes in Allah and his decree, do this. but whoever believes in Allah in the last day. Because the first part is actually believing that you have a creator who created you for a purpose, who has commanded you and prohibited you from doing certain things, right? And then you have to believe that there's an account for that, which is, which is the Yom Al-Akhir, right? Man kana yu'minu billahi wal Yom Al-Akhir. There are people, yani throughout the Quran, and, you know, as, as you read the Quran, you should be looking for those connections to the people who do good things, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually ties their belief in, in those doing good things to what? To belief in the hereafter. And people who are doing things that are wicked, in them kanu, la yarjuna hisaban. I mean, they weren't expecting to be held to account. So they just did whatever they want. And that's in general, people are going to do what they want if they don't feel like there's going to be any accountability. Mm-hmm. Just do what they want. And they'll do it for years because they don't believe that, they, that they're going to be held accountable for that. And subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who created us and he knows our psychology. And he knows what we do when we don't think that we're going to be held accountable for anything. SubhanAllah. Yeah. In Surah to Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rijalun, la tulhihim tijaratun wa la veyun, and thikrillahi wa yukamis salah wa yita zaka, yakhafuna yawman tatakallabu fihil kulubu wal abasar. Right? What is it that that made these people stick to the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rijalun, la tulhihim tijaratun wa la veyun, and thikrillahi. They are a people whose business and their, 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 
their commerce did not prevent them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from establishing a salah, from giving zakat. Yakhafuna yawman. They fear day. That's, that's, that was the motivation, because they fear that day, right? When their, their hearts and their abasar will tataqallab, flip. Allah musta'an. So, uh, in any event, there, there's, there's, there's so many places in the Quran. As you read the Quran, look for those connections to what al Imam bil Akhirah should do for a person and look at what happens when the people do not believe in the hereafter. And there's a great disparity, by the way, between people who believe in Allah and people who actually believe in the last day. And I'm not talking about amongst the Muslims, I'm saying people in general. Statistically, right? There are a lot of people who say they believe in Allah. When, when you get to the last day, or when you get to accountability in the hereafter, that number dwindles significantly. Allahu al Musta'an. Tayyib. Trial of the grave. Sheikh, read that again for us, Malish. Conceptualization? Well, yeah. So, what do we mean when we say the trial of, of the grave? What does that actually mean? Conceptualizing it. So, we want to talk. What, what does that mean? Three questions? Right. So, that <laughs> refers to the three questions. That a person will be asked in the grave, which we'll get to, inshallah. Tayyip. Evidence for its existence. And what evidence do we have that there is actually a trial in the grave? The hadith. Tayyip, what hadith? I'm not sure. That's cool. That's good. What hadith? Now. The one when the Muslim lost his son was walking past the grave and he, uh, he put the leaves on the grave. All right, all right, so stay with me. Is that, is that the trial of the grave or that's showing something else that's happening in the grave? Huh. So the trial would be considered the punishment? No, the, no, no. A trial is a test. So a person may pass that test or may not, right? So the trial is not the punishment. The, the punishment is a result of the failed trial, right, of a failed test. So, so we have the hadith type. The, the, uh, g give me something that shows that you know what the hadith says. Yeah. It's the hadith of the Prophet said that when the, when the person is put inside the grave, once their, their people leave, then the, the angels come and then they question. Correct. The question Correct. The hadith where the Prophet some said when a person is put in the grave and the people leave, then the angels come, two angels come and they question. Type. Is there anything from the Quran? Anything, any ayah from the Quran? That talks about the trial of the grave. Like, open up to Surah Ibrahim, 27th ayah. So Ibrahim is the 14th surah in the Quran. Surah Ibrahim, the 27th ayah. Uh, somebody read. Surah, Surah. And then I will. Bismillah. 27th ayah. Hey, hey. Now. Allah keeps firm those who believe with firm. Tayyip, Tayyip. Iqra, Iqra. Bisotin alim. And Allah keeps firm those who believe with firm Allah word. keeps firm those who believe. Uh-huh. Uh, with firm word, with worldly life With the firm and the world and the worldly life in the hereafter. Tayyip, is that a proof for the trial in the grave? No. No? Yes. Tayyip, I ain't hear anything about any trial or any grave in that ayah. Tayyip, maybe. Allah Alam. We'll get there, inshallah. Al Muhammad, just put a pin in that, inshallah. <laughs> Surah Ibrahim, the 27th ayah. Tayyip, Fadl Shaykh. Right. And, and then the last thing there is the. The believer versus the kafir. Right. So the trial of the grave, the believer is going to be able to answer a certain way, and the kufar are going to answer a different way. Tayyip, let's look at what it says here. Bismillah. Right. Included in having faith in the last day is to believe in all that the Prophet والسلام, informed us of regarding what will happen after death. They believe in the trial of the grave, in the punishment of the grave, and in the bliss of the grave. So, so th that's called the barzakh, okay? That, that stage there is the barzakh, right? And we don't just say the trial of the grave, it's not encompassing of the barzakh, because the, the trial is only the first thing that happens. Then there's uh, punishment and there's bliss, or some combination of the two. 
As regards the trial, man will be tested in his grave. He will be asked, who is your Lord? What is your religion? Who is your prophet? Allah will make those who believe who have faith firm. The Allah will make those who have faith firm with the firm word in this life and the hereafter. Ah, okay. So that's the, uh, that's the ayah from Surah Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. And so the believer will reply, Allah is my Lord, Islam is my religion, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is my prophet. Mm -hmm. However, the one who has to come to doubt will say, Ha, ha, I do not know. I heard people saying something, so I, I said it as well. Then he will be beaten with an iron rod, and he will cry out with a, such a, with a wail that will be heard by everything save everything except mankind for were he to hear it he would swoon he would faint yeah so and this is uh, directly from the hadith of the prophet والسلام, so it shows the trial of the grave and that there are three questions who is your lord what is your religion and who is your prophet and uh subhanallah I mean, the fact that we know the three questions and you know the answers to those three questions does not mean that you can answer it in the hereafter. Only those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes firm will be able to actually answer those questions in the hereafter. And it's not based on the fact that you know the Arabic language or you, you memorize the answer to the questions and you've been <laughs> saying it since you know you went to Sunday school or whatever. It's it's not what it's about. It's about tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah Azza wa Jal making a believer firm. How, that being said, there is a great book that is written on this topic exactly. And subhanAllah, now if you think about somebody who has a regular test, I mean high school or college or something like that, and you've got a friend and he's like, look, I pretty much know what the questions are going to be. Let's sit down. Let's go over the question. I can help you out. That's like your best friend in the world. You say, mashallah, you I mean, you really, like, you saved my life. Well, this is literally salvation is based on these three questions. And Al-Usul uh, al by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, is, yani, in terms of compilation, one of the best books written on just these three questions. Ma rabbuk, ma dinuk, ma nabiyuk. And so Usul al is a very important book to study. Because salvation is based on the answer to those three questions. He did a service to the Ummah and he, with that book. طيب. So this uh, is the proof from the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, that there will be a trial. طيب. Read the, just the English, inshallah. Of course. Quranic evidence for trial of the grave. It was narrated from Al-Bara' Al 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 ibn Azib that, uh, an, that the Prophet والسلام, said, Allah will keep firm those who believe with the world that stands firm. With the, with the word, word that say. stands firm. My eyes are messing up. That says word. No, no, no. Your eyes are fine, see? <laughs> okay. They wrote it wrong. Okay. With the word that stands firm in this world and in the hereafter. This was... This was... Revealed mm -hmm. concerning the torment in the grave. It will be said to him, the deceased that is, who is your Lord? And he will say, my Lord is law and my prophet is Muhammad. That is what is the meaning of his saying, Allah will keep firm those who believe with the word that stands firm in this world and in the hereafter. Right, and this is the tafsir from the Prophet والسلام, for the ayah in Surah Ibrahim. Once we have the tafsir of the Prophet والسلام, we don't really need the statement of anyone else. So this is Quranic evidence I mean, for the trial of the grave. As for punishment and bliss in the grave, which the author is going to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, then there are, yeah, I mean, we, I've just mentioned two, but there's evidence from the Quran, from the Sunnah, and Ijma' of Ahl Sunnah as it relates to this. Here we just have some of the ayat from the Quran, and I'll just go through this very quickly, inshallah ta'ala. Surah uh, Ghafir, the 45th and 46th 
ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa qala Allah sayati ma makaru wa haqa bi ali fir'auna su'u al-'adhab an-nar yu'radun 'alayha ghuduwan wa 'ashiya wa yawma taqumu as-sa'atu adkhilu ali fir'auna shadd al-'adhab so um the 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 shahid here is if you go to the 46th ayah of surah ghafir if you have it in front of you you should pull it up right and now uh, uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the fire they will be exposed to the fire both in the morning and in the evening or now in the day when the hour is established it will be said enter al fir'aun the worst punishment طيب. so this is happening when now right it's happening now, and the sa'ah has not been established. The hour has not been established. They're still being exposed day and night, so they're being punished in the grave. In Surah an nahl which we'll read now, inshallah, among the proofs, this is uh, Shaykh, Shaykh, Shaykh Muhammad Salih al-Uthaymi, rahimahullah, it says, among the proofs contained in the Quran, statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, الذين تتوفاهم الملائكة طيبين يقولون سلام عليكم ادخلوا الجنة بما كنتم تعملون those whose lives the angels take while they are in a pious state saying to them سلام عليكم enter you paradise type this is when at the moment of death due to this it is reported an authentic hadith that will be said to the soul of a believer come out O pure soul to the forgiveness and pleasure of Allah it's the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib uh, about the pun about the what happens when a believer dies and what happens when a when a kafir dies, which we'll cover in a minute, inshallah ta'ala. It will become joyous for this glad tidings of the part easily, even if the body is experiencing agonies, since the soul is cheerful and happy to depart. So this is one of the other any texts that the scholars use to show that there is bliss uh, in the grave. From the Sunnah of the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam, it is mutawatir and there's so many different narrations of the Prophet ﷺ that talk about the punishment and the bliss of the grave. One of the uh, best books yani, compiled in that is the book of Imam al-Bayhaqi rahimahullah ta'ala called Ithbatu Adab al-Qabr. Now, we'll su'ad al So, so it's mutawatir from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And one of those hadith I just mentioned here is the one that Basil was talking about earlier, which is when the Prophet ﷺ went by the grave and he said that these two are being punished. They're not being punished for something that is major. In fact, it is major. Meaning that what they did was considered to be a major sin. As for one of them, that he did not prevent the urine from being on himself, which obviously affects his prayer and everything else affects his uh, in Salah. وَأَمَّا الْآخَرْ فَكَانَ يَمْشِي بَيْنَ النَّاسِ بِنْ نَمِيمَ And as for the other one that he used to go between people spreading rumors and cause them fitna between them. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that they're being punished now and the hour was not established. As for Ismail al sunnah ibn Abd al-Barr and Noe ibn Hajar and others from most of the scholars have mentioned that it is the consensus of the people of the sunnah that there is punishment and bliss in the grave. And once there's ijma', you actually, at that point, mukhalafat wal ijma' to go against the ijma' is considered to be uh, either bid'ah or it takes one outside of the fold of Islam, depending on what the situation is. Tayyip. Fadl Shaykh, iqra bi surah alo samahit. Al Bara ibn Ba'azib, very well, said, We went out with the Prophet وسلم, to the funeral of a man of the Ansar and came to the grave. It had not yet been dug, so Allah's messenger sat down and we sat down around him quietly. He had in his hand a stick with which he was making marks on the ground. Then he raised his head and said, seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of the grave, saying it twice or three times. He then said, when a believer is about to leave the world and go forward to the next world, angels with faces white as the sun come down to him from heaven with one of the shrouds of paradise and some of the perfume of paradise and sit away from him as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death comes and sits, and sits at his head and says, good soul, come out to forgiveness and acceptance from Allah. 
Maghfira wa ridwan min Allah. It's translated as acceptance. Ridwan is a bit more than that. Nah. It then comes out as a drop. As a drop flows from a water skin and he seizes it. And when he does so, they do not leave in his hand for an instant, but take it and place it in that shroud and that perfume. And from it, there comes forth a fragrance like that of the sweetest musk found on the face of the earth. They then bring him to the lowest heaven and ask that the gate should be open for him. This is done. And from every heaven, its angels escort him to the next heaven till he is brought to the seventh heaven. And the law, who is great and glorious, says, record the book of my servant in Iliyun. It's uh, Quran, that's the 83rd surah. Surah Mutafifun, now. And take him back to earth, for I created mankind from it. I shall return them to it, and from it I shall bring them forth another time. His soul is then restored to his body. Two angels come to him and make, and make him sit up and say to him, Who is your Lord? He replies, My Lord is Allah. They ask, What is your religion? And he replies, My religion is Islam. They ask, Who is this man and who was, who was sent among you? And he replies, He is Allah's messenger. They ask, What is your source of knowledge? And he replies, I have read Allah's book, believed in it, and declared it to be true. Then one cries from heaven, my servant has spoken the truth. So spread out carpets from paradise for him. Clothe him from paradise. And open the gate for him into paradise. Then some of its joy and fragrance comes to him. His grave is made spacious for him as far as the eye can see. And a man with a beautiful face, beautiful garments, and a sweet odor comes to him and says, Rejoice in what pleases you, for this is your day, which, which you have been promised. He asks, Who are you? For your face is perfectly beautiful and brings good? He replies, I am your good deeds. Yeah. He then says, my Lord, my Lord, bring the last hour. My Lord, bring the last hour so that I may return to my people and my property. This hadith is collected by Imam Ahmed, greatest sahih, by Ibn Manda al-Bayhaqi, Sheikh al-Bani and al-Arna'ut, and Sheikh Muqbil rahimahullah said that it's Hassan. In any event, this hadith is something that... Um, and I, I, you should read frequently. Read frequently. It, it, it talks about the importance of believing in the Quran. Like, look at what is your source of knowledge? He replies, I have read a law's book. I read a law's book. Believed in it. I declared it to be true. I mean, what, what is that, that person that comes to him in that beautiful form, smelling good? Who are you? I am your good deed. And he, the importance of sticking to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reading it, believing it, knowing that it's true, the importance of doing good deeds, it cannot be, it cannot be overstated. It cannot be overstated. Uh, Allah I, 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 I'll, I'll end here, inshallah. Um, I know we don't have any time left. But this, um, what, what is it that causes people to be punished in the grave? Uh, this question was asked to Imam Ibn Muqayyim rahimahullah and he said أَمَّا الْمَسْأَلَةُ التَّاسِعَةَ وَهِيَ قَوْلُ السَّائِلْ مَا الْأَسْبَابُ الَّتِي يُعَذَّبُ بِهَا أَصْحَابُ الْقُبُورِ and what is it that causes people to be punished in the grave? He said فَجَوَابُ هَمَ وَجْحَيْمْ وَجْمَنْ وَمُفَصَّلْ and there's two different ways to answer this there's a, there's a, a general way that we can answer it then we can get more detail he says أَمَّا الْمُجْمَلْ فَإِنَّهُمْ يُعَذَّبُونَ عَلَى جَهْلِهِمْ the, the general reason that people are punished in a grave is because of the ignorance of Allah. The ignorance of Allah. وَإِضَاعَتُهُمْ نَعْمْ عَلَى جَهْلِهِمْ بِاللَّهِ وَإِضَاعَتِهِمْ لِأَمْرِهِ And because they neglect his command وَارْتِكَابِهِمْ لِمَعَاصِي And because they do what he has prohibited. Or they, they're sinful. فَلَا يُعَذِّبُ اللَّهُ رُوحًا عَرَفَتْهُ وَأَحَبَّتْهُ وَامْتَثَلَتْ أَمْرَهُ وَاجْتَنَبَتْ نَهْيَهُ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not, does not uh, uh, punish the soul that knows him, loves him, uh, fulfills his commands, and avoids his prohibitions. Uh, as, as for what we should do, Based on that, and, we'll, and again, we'll stop here, inshallah. We should, at the end of every single prayer, seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the adab al-qabr. 
Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu say that tashahad ahadukum falasta'id billahi min arba' When one of you says that tashahud, seek refuge with Allah from four things. Say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min a'adhabi jahannam wa min a'adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahya wa al-mamat wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-dajjal And know it, feel it, know what you're saying. O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the torment of hell, from the punishment of the grave from the trials of life and death and from the evil of the trial of Masih al dajjal Wallahi, when we think about being punished in the grave, knowing that each one of us is going to be there at some point, it is very important. This should have meaning when you say this at the end of Salat. It's not just something we should go through as a routine. But you should really think about seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from punishment of the fire, the punishment of the grave, trials of life and death, in the evil trial of al-Masih al-Dajjal. Hadha wa Allahu a'alaikum wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Anna nabiyyina Muhammad subhanahu wa sallam wa alhamdulillah